Before we get to our first speaker, Nolan Goldberg, I want to spend a few minutes talking about why we're doing Strata uh, and in particular Jumpstart. Most of this week is going to be spent asking questions like, what is big data? Uh, and it is a necessarily big tent, just like um, cloud computing. It encompasses a lot of ideas. It's nebulous and hard to get your brain around. And so the idea of big data uh, is something people are debating. Everyone knows what it is. It's kind of like modern art. I know what it is when I see it, but I can't really describe it. Uh, there are a lot of ways that people have tried to describe big data, a series of emerging technologies. Whenever something just starts with a description like that, it's necessarily um, vague. Um, maybe something like a movement to bring large-scale data sets to the public, or even data sets that are awkward to work with using traditional database tools. These are all okay definitions. Uh, my definition is a, um, a little more blunt. Uh, first of all, it starts with large amounts of information, not necessarily huge, but big enough that you can't sort of go through them by hand. Um, and they tend to be, not always, but tend to be sourced from both public and private sources. So maybe it's your customer loyalty information tied to a Twitter feed, for example. Uh, that information is also generally easily linked and connected. Uh, it's got some kind of unique key that you can extract, like a username or a timestamp, so you can tie these things together fairly well. We store it just because we can, because storage is cheap, and we analyze it uh, through algorithms. One of the big contrasts between traditional data analysis and BI and big data is that uh, BI, you knew the schema for the data before you introduced it. So you knew what information you were going to put into that database, and then you introduced the information. Uh, with big data, we often store everything in unstructured formats, and then we have machines pull out the meaning from that data and find the structure within the data after it was stored. And that's actually a very big difference because it changes what we can analyze. We're also doing it very quickly. A lot of the technologies we've seen around highly parallel computing mean that we can analyze this data in near real time, which lends itself to iterative exploration of the data rather than quarterly reports. There's another aspect to this, which I think is really important. We're seeing ourselves apply big data to business. We're seeing it in the hands of everyone, whether you're using a spreadsheet or looking at a Twitter feed or searching on Google. These are all tools that many mortals, not necessarily data scientists, can use to bring data to bear. And often this information is fed back into the system. <clears throat> it's not a one-time report, it's an exploration. It's where you drill down. And I can say, where did you drill down in the study and, and do initial analysis on that thing? Uh, I can take the data I found and reanalyze it, ask additional questions. So it's this, this engagement with the data rather than just a one-time report. So my take on big data, and it's not a nice clean definition, is that it has some or all of these attributes. Why is it a big deal now? Well, there's a few sort of sea changes. In the past, as I said, we had this structural look at data where we knew the schema beforehand. Uh, widgets by quarter by sales region, for example. Uh, that's changing. Today we have a data fire hose and you're essentially forced to drink from it, and the only way you can deal with that is to process it as it arrives, filter it, tag it, and classify it, have machines analyze it, um, which has only become possible with technologies like highly parallel frameworks, um, Hadoop, Cassandra, things like that, um, computing that's cheap enough and fast enough to do this stuff in real time. As a data point, uh, in 2020, a two disk, two and a half inch drive will store 14 terabytes and cost 40 bucks. How many people have 14 terabytes of storage in their organizations today? Right, so when you can carry that around on an iPad, and remember, we'll all still be here. We'll be a little more gray, but have a little less hair, but we'll be here. Um, when you can do that, and that's only 11 years away, uh, sorry, nine years away. When you can do that, you can be doing BI on your iPad. That's a transformative kind of model for personal computing. And, and James Kobelius, who's here with us from Forrester, will expand on this later, but the disruptions that are happening in so-called big data that makes it intensely personal and portable is gonna change how people uh, will go about data analysis in an organization. Big data is also now because it represents a huge advantage to the world. Um, as Arthur C. Clarke famously said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What's often forgotten about that statement is that advancement is in the eye of the beholder. Um, things that I see, I'm a nerd. I have 11 screened interactive devices in my house. But if I show something with big data to someone who's relatively non-technical, they think it's magic. I say this is a website that will tell you your flight is going to be late six hours before the airline knows. That's not technology, that's magic. 
And the great thing about magic is that if you're trying to sell big data to traditional non-technical businesses, if you're trying to show people how they can make their employees more productive, or their supply chain better optimized, or their risk management less risky, big data looks like magic. And if you're in sales, big data is easy to sell because I'm selling you magic. Nobody's immune from the transformative power of this stuff. We just have to look after industry after industry, has fallen in the face of this stuff. Um, you know, here's a store that's being shut down because somebody like Beatport provides very targeted music to a special audience. Uh, Beatport is like a very specialized iTunes for electronic musicians and DJs. They not only sell the music, they also sell the subsets of the song. So if you have a vocal loop that you want to take out and remix yourself, you can do that. Um, so you can, you're actually selling pieces of the music. It's a specialized channel. It costs a little more. When you see that kind of disruption, this was set up by a few people in Colorado. And they're curve for growth is pretty much opposite that of physical record stores. Um, this is a travel agent. Anybody use a travel agent to get here today? Anybody in the room use a travel agent to get here today? So uh, clearly something like Hitmonk that shows you um, the travel you could take, and it's hard to see, but the first search term here is sort by agony. They'll actually show you the travel route that's the least agonizing. That was the job of a travel agent, right? Make my travel less agonizing. Here's an algorithm telling you which flight is least agonizing. Um, there's the industries that keep closing, obviously the obvious ones like Blockbuster, right? Uh, Netflix comes along and says, we're gonna disrupt that space. And if you're one of these companies that's not embracing data, you are the walking dead. You don't know it yet, but you are going to face more and more disruption from more and more new entrants. It's important to ask ourselves, why isn't Blockbuster Netflix? I mean, Reed Hastings needed a spreadsheet that showed where people live and how often they rent movies. You know who had a really good spreadsheet full of data on where people live and how often they rent movies? Blockbuster. They just didn't think the Postal Service was a substitute for retail outlets. But it's not just about new businesses. One of the things you'll hear this week at Strata is the fact that businesses are being changed vertically. Genomics is changing the healthcare industry. Um, geoinformatics is changing how we find natural resources, and so on and so on, vertical applications of data. And when we go and look at those industries, traditional discussion around data has been vertical. In finance and banking, for example, we have quants. In pharmaceutical worlds, we have people like genomics experts doing sequencing. In energy, you have these quantitative geologists finding minerals and, and veins and oil. Uh, in civic planning, you have people who do traffic pattern analysis. For national defense, you have simulations operators. These have traditionally been vertical specializations. Someone who was in finance and banking was a quant, didn't see their skill set as something they could take and go to quantitative geology and have a useful conversation. In the last couple of years, that has changed. We're now seeing the emergence of the data scientist as a new discipline that spans these verticals. And that's a big shift. We saw it about a decade ago in the emergence of the web when you had people who were the networking person or the web designer who became these things called web operators. And we didn't really know what they were. They kind of understood an IP address and a URL at the same time. And now there are entire conferences, books, industries, professional organizations devoted to the rise of the web operator as a class of job. And we are seeing today the rise of the data scientist. Data scientists are pretty important for business. I recently did an analysis of some data and not data companies. For example, here's Amazon's Q4 10 revenue per capita for their employees. Here's Barnes & Noble, Q10, revenue per capita. How much money do you make divided by the number of employees you have? Uh, Netflix, Q9 versus Blockbuster, Q409. Dropbox, about to launch, about to have an IPO, I mean. Here's Dropbox, Q211 versus Groupon, Q211. Both of these look like star-studded IPOs, but the reality is when you dig under the covers, Dropbox is augmenting its sales processes and its employees with data. Groupon is asking salespeople to pound the streets and knock on doors in a non-scalable, non-data-driven way. They're not augmenting their employees and their human capital with data capital. Who would you rather be in this case? Let's say you could be Amazon. This is market cap per capita of an employee. Now, Amazon is not doing that well. Compared to Barnes & Noble, they're doing great. They're not doing that well in this context because they have a lot of businesses that are very atomic. There's stuff to move around, pardon me, there's shipping and so on. But Amazon is still far, far better than someone like in Barnes & Noble. Um, 
So apologies to the Axis for making Amazon look small. They are way, way better than their competitor. Um, Netflix versus Blockbuster. This is, again, um, market cap uh, per capita. Blockbuster being bankrupt right now. Uh, Dropbox versus Groupon. In every case, the company that has figured out how to augment its human processes with technology and data is valued far higher by the, the, by the market, can change more quickly because it has fewer employees to deal with, and so on. It has been said that we live in an information age. I think that's actually inaccurate. Uh, Herbert Simon once said, uh, what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. So we are in an attention age. We are even in a feedback age where we are listening to the information we glean from others, applying it to new data, and iterating through another cycle of analysis and business. So we asked ourselves, what would an MBA look like in a data-filled world? And this was the germ that led to Strata. We literally went to various Ivy League business schools curricula, pulled down the courses they had, and said, how would data transform supply chain optimization? How would data transform HR? How would it transform risk management, treasury management, strategic planning, product planning, and so on? And then we went through our list of people we knew or we'd heard about who had insights into how data was transforming those verticals and set up today's curriculum. Once upon a time, a leader's job was to convince others in the absence of data. Today, a leader's job is to know which questions to ask. I believe that in an era of technology and information and feedback and attention, we'll be judging companies by their ability to augment people with technology. And today's curriculum is about how do you augment traditional business administration with data and information. Welcome to Jumpstart. That's what we're going to look at today. I hope you find it as interesting as I know it's been to prepare.